Welcome to Scene Change, a podcast by the National Federation of the Blind's Performing Arts Division. All about equality, opportunity, accessibility, and the arts. Here, you'll learn adaptive techniques from performers in the know. We are changing what it means to be blind, one stage at a time. Thank you for joining us today. Hey everybody, I'm Wazi Mohammed Park, Vice President of the National Federation of the Blind Performing Arts Division and your host. Today's show is all things strings. As you know, I love to rhyme, so we'll see how long I can keep this going. Welcome to today's episode of Scene Change. We're so fortunate to have one of our board members here today. She's a cellist. She's a federationist from Illinois, and she brings a lot to the Performing Arts Division. Leslie Hamrick. How are you, Leslie? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. We also have from the great state of Michigan, one of our newest members to the Performing Arts Division. She's a violinist. She's a high school student. She's been playing violin since, oh, what, age five or so? Uh, And I think that's all I know about her for now. So we're going to get to know her a lot better in this episode. Julia LeGrant. How are you, Julia? Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Yes, I did start playing violin at five, so you got it right. (laughs) (laughs) I can do math. That's good. Basic math. Um, What's your musical background? Do you know, I know that you started at age five, but does, you you know, does any of your family play music, sing, anything like that? Do you play any other instruments? Yeah, so I began violin at age five, as you said. Um, My sister uh, began cello around the same time. Uh, She's four years older than me, but she is currently a cello performance major at the University of Michigan. Um, And we're definitely the most musical of our siblings. Um, (laughs) Our parents are pretty musical. Um, Neither of them are professional musicians, but my mom did a lot of piano in high school and some in college and uh, invested a lot in helping us become more musical with her musical background. So that's really cool. Do you play any piano or just violin? I did play piano. I had a few like multiple year times when I played piano, but Mm -hmm. um, so I played it for about two years when I was very young and then two years when I was in middle school. Um, And I did a lot of jazz uh, also in middle school along with the piano. And then I transferred into violin jazz and Uh, I don't really do much jazz anymore. I'm mainly classical now, but Mm -hmm. that's some of my background as well. That's really cool. Leslie, remind us, tell, I want to hear, so I read, because I was stalking you before the show, um, that's not weird at all. I read that you met your husband. Was that in the summer uh, program that you did? And also what instrument does your son play? Because that's going to bother me for the rest of the day, (laughs) if I don't ask you. So I met my husband at the Meadowmount School of Music, which is an eight-week summer program, no, seven-week summer program in Westport, New York. And he had studied with Tanya Carey for a year and a summer. He was studied with her at Michigan State. And then I met him, he was one of her graduate assistants. For the camp. So he was assigned to help the new students out and make sure they got acclimated. So it started out where he was my reader and he would explain Tanya Carey's methods because some of them were a little interesting and hard to get used to, but it uh-huh. eventually made sense. And as they say, that was in the year 2000, and it's the year 2020. And as they say, the rest is history. That is lovely. I was reading your article in the Braille Monitor, and for anyone who has not checked that out, they should definitely go read it. And in there, you say that you that she would not um, let you essentially use a reader. Because, okay, if I understand it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Leslie. Your readers would read the music, essentially play it, and then you would listen to it on tape. Is that right? Or like, you know, listen to a recording and practice that way? I had two graduate assistants when I was at Northern, both of them cellists. 
And that was during my undergrad. And everything that I learned, yes, one of them would play what I had to learn on tape. So they'd play the piece on tape, call out fingerings, bowings, dynamics. And the same process pretty much applied, whether it was orchestra music or solo repertoire. And when I got to Meadowmount, Tanya Carey basically said, nope, you're going to learn how to do it yourself. And you have the music. Mm -hmm. And that was that. She was pretty insistent about not letting anybody record anything for me. And but you first, became... It Sorry. felt like my world was turned upside down, but it was the best thing that she ever did before me because now, for me because now I can pick up a piece of music and learn it without any assistance. And you can interpret it however you want. And you were talking about the power of Braille music and um, saying that that's what it provides. And funnily enough, Julia, who we have on our show today, is actually one of your Braille music students. Julia. That's correct. How is it going, uh, learning Braille music, and how long, you know, how new or experienced are you with it, and how is it? I began learning Braille music when I was very young, and I was self-taught out of some books and with some assistance from my mother, um, which was a really great experience, but I really didn't use it very much for violin. Um, I used it some for piano because my piano music was very simple um but really it sort of languished those skills um and then recently I read Leslie's article that you were talking about earlier and I really got inspired to start working on real music again and now that I am it's been really it's been pretty difficult actually um, but it's been amazing. I think it's really incredible to actually read what I'm playing and not just listen to other people play it, listen to sort of imprecise interpretations, listen to things that maybe aren't exactly what the composer wrote, but to have at my fingertips exactly what the composer wrote is such an incredible ex experience and I think really enhances my ability as a performer to convey what is supposed to be conveyed and to make my own artistic decisions. I think it's been incredible and I look forward to how it will improve my performance as I get better at it. Wow. And that's how you found out about Leslie. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. That's great. Yeah. Wow. So what made you choose the violin? Um, it was offered to me, I think is the simplest answer. Um, my, mother asked me if I would like to play music and she suggested the violin. I didn't know much about it, but cause I was five, you know, so, but I really wanted to play music. And so I started. Mm. And was that, was it easy? Like, I mean, so it sounds like, you know, your mom kind of said like, Oh, like this would be a cool instrument. And you were like, yeah, sure. So, I mean, coming into it, um, so young and as a blind child, was it easy to just kind of jump right into your first lesson? Did you face any sort of discrimination from a teacher or maybe that was shielded from you? I don't know. I, I mean, I think I was young and un young enough and unaware enough. I mm. didn't, I've only, I would say like only in the last few years have I ever really thought about my blindness in relationship mm -hmm. to my music at all. Um, I think I always had some sense that like I was using some adaptive techniques, but it never really bothered me. My teachers were extremely accommodating and it didn't really matter to them, or at least they didn't let on that it mattered to them. So, I mean, they, I was fortunate enough to have really great teachers when I was young. And so it never really mattered to me. I think I just did, really good. did music first. So, yeah. That's really good. How about for you, Leslie? What made you choose the cello? And did you face discrimination with playing that specific instrument? So I started playing cello when I was eight. And ironically enough, my mom was the one that suggested the cello because my brother was already playing violin. Mm -hmm. And so and my brother and I used to play duets all the time with like our orchestra music. He was first violin and I was cello so we would 
put on these concerts on Saturday nights for our parents, and we called them mini concerts, and it was really a lot of fun. And I was already playing piano, and then two years after I started piano, I started cello, and then when I was 14, I started voice. So obviously, I had to make a decision, because there was no way I could major at all three of them. (laughs) So when I was a senior in high school, I decided that I wanted to major in cello. I always loved the sound of the cello, and it just clicked with me. Even it was very different from, like, I clicked with piano, but with the cello, it was just totally different. It was like, it felt like it was a part of me, and I still Mm -hmm. feel that way. And did anyone ever try to stop you from playing it, or was it always smooth sailing? Um, I was pretty fortunate to have really good teachers. And when I was 16, I auditioned for the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. And at that time, I was starting to have tendonitis. And it was getting worse. It wasn't going away. So I auditioned for the person that was auditioning people for Chicago Youth Symphony and it so turned out that he was a cellist and he heard me play and he basically said okay I could give you a million reasons why you're having this tendonitis problem and if you don't relearn your technique you're not going to be able to play in a year or two so I started studying with I stopped studying with my former private teacher and started studying with him And I think the best thing that my first private teacher could have ever done for me was she insisted that I play with expressiveness and play musically. So when this guy from Chicago Youth Symphony took me on as a student, he had commented that I play with my soul. And I just had to relearn how to play again. I had to relearn my technique again. And and that was, of course, the best thing that ever happened to me as well, because I started studying with this teacher. He made everything go in a very different, more serious direction. And slowly I decided that I wanted to major in cello performance. So was your tendonitis from playing uh, the cello? Yeah, I was very tense. I I was playing with a very tense technique and positioning and everything from my feet upward was tense. So I had to relearn everything, even how I had my feet on the floor and how I sat down on the chair and how I held the cello. And it was just, it was tough, but it was well worth it. Could each of you describe for me what your instrument looks like physically for anyone who's never seen it before and they're just curious to know? Because I feel like these instruments, it's expected that everyone knows what a cello looks like. Everyone knows what a piano looks like. Everyone knows what a violin looks like. But for those who haven't physically seen one before, they've only heard it. So the cello is like, the, the shape of a violin, it's much bigger than a violin. You hold it between your knees. And it also goes much lower, but it can go pretty darn high, too. It's got a pretty wide range. And you, have, you hold it between your legs, and it's got the four strings go vertical, like from the top to the bottom. And Which shoulder do you rest it on? the left and you play with your what hand you finger i finger i finger with the left hand and i bow with the right hand or i pizzicato which is plucking string pizzicato with the right hand it's got these things that look like the sides look like letter c's one's pointing to the right and one's pointing to the left like backwards and those are called the ribs and where I hold the, the cello, my, my knees are below those ribs. And it's got a top and a bottom, and it's got a sound post 
which is like a popsicle stick, and that's what makes the sound resonate in the instrument. When you put your knees on it, are you putting your knees on the sort of like body of it or that long skinny part that where the strings kind of meet together? Yeah, the neck is up at the top. So that rests kind of near your shoulder. It doesn't rest on the shoulder. Oh, I was picturing this the opposite way. Right. And then the end pin, the scroll is at the top. And that's like a long rolled up piece of wood. And then you keep going down. I, I like to think of that as the head of the cello. Mm-hmm. And then you go, you go all the way down. And the, the foot, I like to think of the foot of the cello as the end pin. And the end pin is this skinny pole that pulls in and out. It adjusts the height of your cello. So does your cello rest on the floor, on your chair? I know it's between your legs, but is is there a stool for it? There is the end pin. You can either have, it all depends on what you want to do. You could have a very sharp end pin that you just dig into the floor. Or a lot of people, if they want to protect the floor, you can put a rubber tip over your end pin. Or you can use something called a rock stop which is like, looks like a hockey puck with a, a a hole in it for your end pin. Not a hole, but like an indent of metal for your end pin. Or you could use a device called a zeros anchor, and there's one end on it that literally looks like a zero, and you attach that to one of the legs of, of your chair, the either the front right or the front left and then there's a strap and you can adjust the strap to how far how close you want the cello to be and then at the end of the strap there's a like a square hockey puck with a circle in it and then the the end pin goes in that circle wow okay so if i understand this correctly you almost play if you know about the violin, which we will talk about next, you almost play the, the cello in the opposite direction of the violin. Is that right? Yes. Wow. I never knew that. I tried playing violin once and everything was just all backwards. <laughs> I see. So, Julia, would you describe to our listeners what a violin looks like? Sure. So I will start with what Leslie called like the head of the violin, which is the scroll. Um so like a cello or the violin has a scroll. So it's basically, yeah, it kind of looks like a piece of round up like wood. Um, some can be decorative, but that's like very rare. So it's a scroll. And then that has like four sort of very small sticks pointing out of it, I guess, that are two on each side, which, you know, are the pegs that adjust the tuning of the strings. Like, you know, like a guitar has, um, And then from there, there's like a long, pretty skinny piece of wood that's called the neck. And the strings start in the scroll by the pegs. And then they come up the neck. And then on top of the neck is like a, like the top of the neck, you basically call it the fingerboard. And that's what the strings like go over. And then once the neck meets the body of the violin, the fingerboard keeps going. And then the strings keep going even past when the fingerboard eventually stops. And then the strings keep going and they go over a piece of wood called the bridge, which kind of protrudes from the viol, like from the face of the violin. And then they continue, they keep going to basically the back of the violin for lack of a better word, if the scroll is the front and the, like the where the strings finally end at your shoulders, the back, um, you could call the back of the violin, I guess, um, is a mm, mounted place for the shoulder uh, called a shoulder rest. And, or sorry, rather a chin rest. Sorry. I, <laughs> um, so that's where you put your chin. It's like a cup shaped sort of. Um, and then you have a shoulder rest underneath that, which is not part of the violin. You take it on and off. And it helps you get your violin farther from your shoulder, basically. So the shoulder rest basically has direct contact with your body. And the violin is a bit above that. 
Um, and some, not all people use shoulder rests. And then the, uh, the body of the violin sort of looks like two, almost like two, they're like the C's. And then at either end of the C's, uh, you curve sort of. So closer to the neck and the shoulders, there's like a bigger circle. And then at either end of the circle you get to the seas and then you go down the sides of the seas to a set of smaller circles and then that's what like the neck and the fingerboard go on top of sorry that's probably a terrible description i don't it's really not have, i don't really it's, have to describe the violin very often. no it's not but you know why i ask well i asked for the for the reasons that i talked about and also when i first started playing violin because i learned everything that you just described i couldn't stop drawing them like it was like at first I didn't know what they looked like and then I started playing so I had to know each part of it you know for yeah. playing purposes and then I just couldn't stop drawing them because I was like I know what this looks like finally I just would, like draw them everywhere like I have notebooks full of just violin drawings they all yeah. the same <laughs> I did a lot of drawing when I was younger <laughs> and just to sorry sort of finish again like the cello you do finger with the left hand and then you hold a bow in the right hand which is like long and it has like a tip um, mm-hmm. where basically a long stick of wood meets with hair and then they both come down I guess and eventually they meet again at the frog which is like a larger piece and that of wood and then that has a screw that like tightens and loosens the hair and then you hold that with your right hand thank you I totally almost forgot about the bow and one thing that I just wanted to um and it's funny. So you you talk about the two C shapes, and then you said there's like a top above the C shapes. There's sort of a, like half circles. I kind of think of that as like a shoulders, like of like a body. It's like the yeah. shoulders, and then yeah. it kind of goes in like really skinny, you know. Yeah. And then it kind of comes out for like smaller like hips almost. Is like kind of how I think of it. Yeah. And then, <laughs> what's your first memory of a cello? Listening to Yo Yo Ma play. Uh, my aunt got me a record of. Yo-Yo Ma playing the first and the second Bach suites for unaccompanied cello by Bach. And I remember listening to him play. I'm like, I want to play like that. Wow. How about for you, Julia? What's your first memory of the violin? I very clearly remember like bits and pieces of my very first violin lesson. Um, I was, Mm -hmm. I remember just being so excited um, and just thrilled to be starting I think my first memory of the sound of the violin and how beautiful and wonderful it was, was when I was considering a new violin, um, a half size violin. So moving up from a quarter size to a half size because I was growing um, and there are different instrument sizes according to your size. And I remember I was getting that and you know getting any new instrument you try some out so I just remember having a variety of those violins and just playing through several of them and just being overwhelmed by the beauty of the sound Uh, it was a really amazing experience it is a really beautiful sound um it's actually the first instrument I ever played when I was in the fourth grade was violin and it's interesting that you both kind of say that you didn't really face a lot of discrimination because I didn't either Um, and I don't know if that's a strings thing or a strings teacher thing or what but I'm sure our listeners will comment um, their stories and their experiences Julia can you tell me your first memory of even playing with an orchestra and you know how that was different from your first lesson and things like that so I started playing in a youth orchestra uh, through a local music school when I was in third grade. It was a really cool experience to play with such a large body. Mm-hmm. I do actually, this is bringing to mind a story about um, being denied um, the concert master position because I remember very clearly the conductor and we did eventually get through this with this person and they um changed their position eventually but i do remember very clearly they're like oh yeah we uh her chair audition was the best but like we she can't sit first because Mm. like yeah no we we can't do that so 
that I remember was probably my first major encounter with some sort of discrimination. And I totally forgot about that when you asked about that earlier. But. What was their reasoning? Wait, so you couldn't, I don't know what the duties of a concert master are. But like, what were their, what, what was their reasoning? Like she can't sit first because. Yeah, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. Um, so I think some of the, I mean, the reasoning primarily is probably based around, as you said, like what the roles are. And basically it's to present a person who is, like very competently applying all of the, you know, all of the correct bowings and correct notes and correct rhythms. And in some sense, like doing some sort of leading with like physically a bit of, you know, leading to some extent, um, I mean, nothing crazy or anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I don't think probably her concern was that I couldn't fulfill that role. So even though this person changed their mind, um, were you able to sit first or were, did you have to take second or like a different position? Um, I think that year I did not play first. The next year she let me, but yeah, I think after I had proved myself, I don't know, or maybe she changed her mind. I don't know, but the next year I was able to, so. That's good. That's amazing. That's great. Um, that you were able to, not that you were able to do it. I think, I think it is great that you're able to do it because I mean, I can't, but (laughs) that's, that's totally different. Um, it's amazing that, you know, you're able to fight and get what you needed and, you know, ensure that you you took your rightful place as first uh how about you leslie what is your like either your first memory your earliest memory or just a fun memory of playing in in an orchestra my first memory of orchestra was the first rehearsal and everybody playing together and i had of course learned some of the music ahead of time with my teacher recording a phrase and then i'd play it back and I'd have the recorder on during the whole lesson. So she'd play a phrase, I'd play it back. And then play another phrase, and I'd play it back. And I just remember thinking, this is so cool when you put everybody together. Mm-hmm. And it just sounds so beautiful and so full and so warm. And my mom always said that I never wanted to leave rehearsal she had to literally fight with me sometimes to go home from <laughs> rehearsal because I didn't want to leave. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, you're a teacher. I feel like somewhere out there, though maybe the three of us didn't <laughs> face any particular discrimination, somewhere out there, someone listening um, thinks that blind people can't keep up with an orchestra or something along those lines. Um, what tips do you all have for keeping track of the music what sound cues do you listen to what kind of uh, alternative techniques are you using when you're you know on that stage um and not as a blind person what well, could be as a blind person or it just could be as a performer um i don't know which is harder to do a you know an orchestra performance or a solo could you give us some techniques for getting through that one or just whichever well i have a lot more experience probably as a solo performer or small chamber groups like I have done a fair amount of orchestra but um probably not as much as solo and stuff so I can probably speak better to that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Um, I think that one thing that I have found particularly challenging as a blind musician is figuring out a lot of stuff about stage presence um and especially as a soloist how to really, you know, move my body in a way that is both conducive to the music and not distracting and really conveys what I want it to um, because I don't have, you know, obviously the experience of watching other performers, how they move their bodies and all that kind of thing. So that's something that I've worked on a lot with my teacher Mm -hmm. um and I wouldn't say I have any like fantastic tips um but I think it's really easy to get bogged down and feel like this is impossible I know I've definitely felt a lot of that in working on stage presence but I think it's important to keep it sort of to whatever extent I think it's important to use the resources around you to keep improving that skill even if it feels really daunting because it 
I have at least experienced it that it's I mean, quite a lot to work through, but I think it's really important and I think it's possible. And I think you can do really wonderful things with it, but you have mm -hmm. to keep trying, I guess. And I think the other thing as a chamber musician, I've worked a lot on communication with other chamber, uh, with other, you know, participants in the chamber group. And I think my clue there, I guess, is just so focused on breathing. And I like that's a thing that sighted and blind musicians need to focus on a lot. But I think particularly blind musicians can benefit maybe even a little more from really, really listening to the breathing of your colleagues and getting often cues that people say, oh, like, look at this person for this. Well, you can do a lot of that by listening to their breath and just sort of like feeling. And it's not, you know, necessarily something you feel with your fingers, but there's just a lot you can pick mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. from feeling the atmosphere and listening to other people that you really don't need sight to fix for you. And I think that's really important to remember that there are ways to communicate with colleagues um, and get that necessary information. Thank you so much. How about for you, Leslie? What kind of tips, tricks, techniques um, have you gained from your years of playing? I would say lots and lots of listening. And I can't emphasize it enough. Listening, again. Uh, another thing is counting. However, if you're having to count like 60 measures, <laughs> you're going to get very bored doing that. So what I try to listen for when I'm learning and when I learn a new piece, the orchestra director says, okay, we're going to play this symphony. Uh, let's pretend it's Beethoven fifth. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is I go get a, a recording. I can go on YouTube and, or an iTunes wherever and get the recording. And I just, I listen to it and just listen over and over and over again. So by the time I get my braille music from the transcriber that I pretty much know it backwards and forwards, upside down. <laughs> and if I have to sit out a whole bunch of measures and wait, I'm not going to be counting that 60 measures. I'm going to be listening for a sound cue. Mm -hmm. Is it the winds? Is it the first violins? Is it the percussion? And I think, um, another thing that helps me is in rehearsal, a lot of times I'll get some verbal cues from my stand partner. Like if we all have to come in at the same time, she gives me a cue of saying, okay, he's getting ready. Okay, three, four, you know, just real quiet. So nobody else but me can hear it. But I know we're ready. I know I can start preparing to play. Um, I think as blind musicians, a benefit to us as blind musicians is we're going to come into rehearsal more prepared because we have to memorize this stuff with a fine tooth comb, whether it's through recordings and someone playing it or whether it's through braille music, it's still memorization. The mm -hmm. only thing that's different between the two is how you take in the notes. Do you listen? Do you read? Do you do both? And that's why it's so good to know the piece because let's say I go on the YouTube on the YouTube video, I'm listening to Beethoven's fifth. I could put that whole picture together. And that's the equivalent to someone cited maybe glancing at the score. When you say put the picture together, you're saying read Braille music and be able to hear what that sounds like. That's you're putting those two pieces, that's the picture? Like more like listening to how the piece goes fit, how it goes together and how the parts all fit into each other. So mm -hmm. then I can follow along with my part and f see how it fits in, how it makes sense. I see. I see. Especially during those really boring cello parts where you might have half notes of a whole bunch of half notes of open G, open D, open G, open D. And then you're <laughs> like, okay, how many of these are there? <laughs> but there might be some lovely melody going on yeah yeah it's so true yeah um, I can definitely attest to that um a lot of my more 
complicated things that I've done. I mean, still just in youth orchestras, but I've relied really heavily on working with a recording of the full orchestra part. Um, just in terms of solidifying memorization, it's been so useful. Um, and one thing I've done too, and I'm not sure if this would be necessarily approved, but I've done a lot of work with just taking recordings and slowing them down and playing with them um, as I'm working on the memorization process, just to really solidify it in that way too. I think that's been a really useful trick that I've used. That is really good. I have to agree on this one. I will often turn up my Alexa to volume number 10 and play (laughs) with the piece that I'm learning. Well, it seems like you guys are using similar techniques um, with a lot of different things. How One of our members asked, how do you keep your bow straight? And I think this is especially hard at the beginning. I think when I stopped playing violin, I only just got the hang of it. (laughs) Which means I probably should have kept going. Well, (laughs) at least from my experience, it's not just at the beginning. Um, It's a constant, interesting experience. It's a constant journey. Um, I think it's a combination of listening to the perfection of the sound. Like there's a certain sound when your bow is even just slightly crooked. And I think the more you can really like get your ears sort of tuned in to what that perfect sound is, I think that's hugely important to figuring out if your bow is straight. Um, And then I think there is, at least on the violin, and I would assume it's the same on the cello, there is a sort of a feeling in the fingers as you hold the bow, you can sort of feel the straightness of the bow and you aren't actually feeling whether it's straight or not straight, but there's some sort of feeling that when you are on the perfect path, there is a balancing of the fingers that occurs that only occurs when it's perfectly straight. So I think those two clues are really important. Um, When I have worked on it, I have used sighted help, especially a few years ago when I really started diving deeper into this. It would have been like two years ago, I really started diving deeper into this. And just to figure out like that perfect sound happens when it's straight. Like what is that perfect sound when it's straight? So I need to know when it's straight to be able to memorize what straight feels like and what straight sounds like. So I did use a fair amount of sighted help at the beginning of that journey, but now I'm still working on it for sure. But I'm now, I know those clues myself. And one last thing is that I do think that even... Like sighted musicians have different ways of figuring out if it's straight or not. Like they can like look in a mirror or I know a lot of people are looking in their Zoom cameras. Um, But it's still difficult for sighted people. And I think it's really easy. I know I'm definitely susceptible to feeling like, oh man, like this is, if like sight would make this task easier and it might make it approachable in a different way, but it's still really difficult for sighted people to have a straight bow. <laughs> My teacher at Meadow Mount had this really cool trick called T for Tone. And what she showed me was that when your bow, and I don't know if this is true on the violin or not, when your bow is straight on the cello, it looks like a letter T between the string and the bow. And the sound just opens up. It's kind of like a flower that just blooms open. The sound just, all of a sudden, it gets louder and fuller. You don't have to work as hard at it. It just comes from the weight of my arm. And I can tell, like, Julia, you were talking about balance. So on the cello, yes, that is true. You're going to balance differently whether you're at the frog or the tip or the middle of the bow. And it's all about arm weight and letting the string hold you up. And so I've used that T for tone a lot with my students. And if the bow isn't straight, you have an X between the bow and the string. And it sounds a lot different. It sounds quieter, it sounds, it could sound scratchier. The bow might skate on the string. So then 
if I, I'm at the point where I can say, I think I hear an X mm. and then I can redirect, like, where's your T? Find your T. Cause I've had to do that with my son a lot, mm. who, by the way, my 10 year old son, Michael is a cellist and he will be playing for two years as of this December. Oh, wow. So I've had to do that a lot with him and I can, I can hear it. It's taken me, it took me years, but I can hear it when the bow straightens out and I can hear it and feel it on my cello when my bow straightens out. Leslie, could you play for us a T and X and a skating sound on your cello just to show our listeners the difference in sound? Yes. So now I'm going to play what it sounds like when you have T for tone and the bow is going straight across the string. Now I'm going to play what an X sounds like when you've lost your T for tone. Leslie, this was another, I don't remember if it was the same article or a different one. You ta- you said something about switching fingers and you were also talking about sound in that article as well. Do you know what I'm referencing? I don't remember which one that was in either, uh, but no, I think, I, I, think either. I was talking about how I can tell if someone's out of tune, if they're, if they're out of tune, it's either the elbow's too low, the left elbow's too low, or the hand isn't balanced so Mm -hmm. that's another thing that i've had to learn to really listen for because i can't i've had to really minimize my touch of meaning how often i touch a student especially with my son Mm -hmm. he has adhd and even though i'm not his private teacher he has a private teacher that he takes lessons from once a week i still had to learn to really tone the touch down because he just he couldn't handle it Mm -hmm. and it's really been an eye-opener for me so to speak because I didn't realize how I mean I knew I could hear some things with sound but I didn't realize just how much and it's only getting to be stronger what I can hear by sound so you can tell all of these things just from listening to your students that's Mm -hmm. really cool yeah or I might say is your wing up Meaning, is your elbow up? It sounds like your your wing may be down. Uh-huh. And we call it wing, our, our wing, and our left elbow is our wing and cello. And then, <laughs> you know, they correct it. And then all of a sudden, the note's in tune. It's pretty cool when you, you have students who are really honest with you. Mm-hmm. And my 14-year-old student that I have, she's the only cellist that I'm teaching online. And... It works well for her, but I don't know how well it would work the teaching online, like with a six-year-old or someone younger, because I would need more sighted help. I think that's tough for anyone. I mean, I know I've been doing Bell and STEM to you and with such young students, I don't think it matters what you're teaching them. I think they, you know, it's, it's a different ball game. Um, And I'm even hearing teachers, whether they're, sighted blind or otherwise just teaching I don't know English is a different a different task so (laughs) than usual so I could totally um see how the online thing would would really change but it's good actually come to think of it and I was thinking of this when you were talking it's good that you sort of um started using less tactile feedback with your students because of the whole online thing because then you're not relying on it you know what I mean Mm -hmm. um and you're able to do it by sound and you know those skills are much stronger for you because you've been practicing it. So that's good. That's really good. Um, I was just going to say, I don't have experience like teaching and identifying those things in students, obviously mm -hmm. pretty young. still, but (laughs) I definitely, um, I can attest to the importance of, you know, that hand frame stuff and intonation and telling when things are out of tune. It's, 
yeah, it's a really interesting experience, even just in myself, like doing the detective work of, okay, there are a variety of problems that could be happening. And like the positioning and the hand frame is just so crucial to making that. And I think that's something that I try to think about when I practice is, you know, how would I explain if I heard this problem, how would I explain Mm -hmm. it? a student and how would I address it in a student and so I think yeah I think a lot about okay well how could a hand frame be adjusted to make this more in tune and stuff like that so is that what you want to do Julia do you want to be a music a music teacher a violin teacher um I definitely want to be something related to professional violin playing Uh Um, Uh I think right now I'm a little more geared towards performance but I can definitely imagine teaching either being a supplement or my primary thing I I mean I really don't know but I mean I could definitely see myself doing it and I want to do violin in some capacity definitely wow that's so cool and I would be remiss if I didn't um mention Leslie's credentials uh beyond doing her prestigious um summer program she is also a graduate of is it pronounced Eastman Leslie Yes, I have a master's degree from Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, and my undergrad degree um, in cello performance, and then my undergrad degree is also in cello performance, and that degree is from Northern Illinois University. And then I have a music therapy background, which means that I went to Western Illinois University to do a music therapy equivalency, and I completed the coursework but not the internship because it didn't work out. I see. We have an amazing cello performer and an amazing violin performer that we're just so lucky to have today. Um, Well-trained, many accolades, many, you know, different things to come and many things that have already come for each of you. I'd like to close out the show with any final advice that you have um, for blind string players and then with a song um, that you'd like to play to, to show our listeners the difference between the violin and the cello. All right. Well, I think the most important thing I have to say is sort of reiterating um, what Leslie said earlier about just the power of listening, I think is just so, so crucial for blind musicians and honestly, all musicians. Um, Listening is so important. And I think it's really wonderful to be able to embrace that as much as possible. And I know that I have had a, I've been fortunate to have really um, wonderful teachers who have worked to adapt things well for me. I know that not all teachers do this, but I've been really fortunate to have great teachers. And so I encourage, I guess I would encourage blind musicians to, you know, seek out teachers who are willing to do this, uh, who are willing to teach adaptively, and just really be open to ways of doing things that might not be how sighted peers do them, but can be incredibly effective. And always remember the power of listening. And what song would you like to play for us? Um, I'll just play a bit of the... Uh, third movement of uh, which is called the Siciliana from the first sonata for unaccompanied violin by Johann Sebastian Bach. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was lovely. What a treat for our listeners and for all of us here as well. Leslie, how about you? What final advice do you have for our, our listeners who might be interested in playing the strings? And what song would you like to play for us? I would say learn Braille music at an early age, preferably when your sighted counterparts are learning Braille music. So you don't have to play catch up. Um, follow your dreams. And if you do run into a teacher or a colleague that is doubtful about your abilities, um, always try to educate first. But remember that it takes two to tango. If you try to educate in the other person, the other person is either going to want to learn, not want to learn, or they could care less. And if you get someone who wants to learn from you, great. If you get someone who doesn't want to learn from you, then they're not worth your time. And just keep moving forward and you can always, you're, you're going to find someone eventually. I experienced this myself with playing in the Elmhurst Symphony. I had a 13-year gap where I had auditioned for an orchestra in 2004, and it didn't go well. The audition didn't go well, and on top of that, the conductor was rather closed-minded about blind people in general and what we could do. And so I finally found the Elmhurst Symphony like 13 years later. I knew that I wasn't going to give up on it, that my dream of playing in a professional orchestra, that somewhere, sometime, an opportunity would come up. And it did. So... Um, hold on to your dreams, and when you go in there to play an audition, go in there as prepared as possible, and first play your excerpts and your pieces, and then this is your time to give your sales pitch and sell yourself, and go in there with confidence, and then the rest is really out of your hands. But as long as you know you've done the best you can, that's all that counts. That's so true. What song would you like to play for us before you go, Leslie? I would like to play part of the jig from the third suite in C major for unaccompanied cello by Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> That was great, Leslie. Thank you so much. This has to be one of our most uplifting, um, though it's only our third, but so far our most uplifting episode of Scene Change. Um, both of you have such positive stories and that's a great thing. It's, you know, it's very fortunate um, that you are both able to find teachers who were open-minded and open to alternative techniques and adaptive techniques. And they were able to train each of you uh, in those methods. And it's just, it's, it's great. It's, um, it's refreshing is the word I'm looking for. It's very refreshing to see here on the show. Um, of course, we want to present all sides of, of various issues. So when the, the negative things come about, they need to be spoken about, but, it's nice to know that sometimes there aren't really many negatives. So thank you both for joining us today. Julia, it's been great getting to know you. And Leslie, it's been great getting to know even more about you. I feel like we already know you in the Federation, but 
whenever we can get to know a member in a different light, uh, we, we're seeing you here as a teacher, as a performer, as a mentor and advisor. And it's just really great for our members to get to know each of you on a personal and professional level. I'm so grateful uh, that we were able to have you here today. Oh, it's been great being on here. I'm so happy I was able to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me as well. Anytime. And this has been another episode of Scene Change. I'm Caitlin McIntyre, president of the National Federation of the Blind Performing Arts Division. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Scene Change. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website at nfb-pad.org. There you'll find links to our social media, membership, and resources for blind performers. Thanks to everyone who makes this show happen. Scene Change is produced by Shane Lowe, Chris Nussbaum, Seyun Choi, and Precious Perez, with music by Ryan Strunk and Tom Page. Remember, you can be the performer you want. Blindness is not what holds you back. We'll see you next time.